Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I'll sit down with a doctor who helped defeat smallpox and actually observed the very last case of it. Dr. Larry Brilliant is among the world's leading epidemiologists. We'll talk about how the past informs the present and what can be done to stop the spread of COVID-19. This is the story of how to change the world. In 1977, a seaplane carrying a medical team from the World Health Organization descended on a place called Bola Island, nestled in the world's largest delta. Their mission, monitor and eradicate a deadly and highly contagious virus, first documented in China and easily spread by droplets from a cough or a sneeze. It sounds familiar, but this is the story of smallpox. And the guy coming off the plane, that's Dr. Larry Brilliant who would go on to co-found the SIVA Foundation treating blindness and later lead Google's worldwide philanthropy. But back then, in this impoverished island community of Bangladesh, he had arrived to observe two-year-old Rahima Banu, the last known case of killer smallpox. After some 3,000 years, the fact that such a widespread disease could be whittled down to one little girl was an extraordinary feat, capping off a monumental global effort. Banu survived, by the way, to understand how it happened and what lessons might be applied to COVID-19, let's take a step back and have a look at how we got here. Egypt may claim the earliest cases. Three out of every 10 people who got it died. And wealth couldn't save you either. Egyptian Pharaoh Ramses V succumbed. So did Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. It went on to kill emperors in Japan, queens in England and Sweden, kings in Spain and France, and a czar in Russia. Something had to be done. Early vaccination efforts began in the late 1700s with mixed results. And as medical technologies evolved, so did the push to stamp it out. On January 1st, 1967, the World Health Organization began a project called the Intensified Smallpox Eradication Program. Earlier eradication efforts had failed, just as they had against malaria and yellow fever. But these scientists had the benefit of something their predecessors didn't, better technology. Prior vaccines were no good in hot climates, but with heat-resistant vaccines and a better way to deliver them, the path to eradication was opening. Still, it couldn't work without heavy surveillance followed by containment. The idea was to get into communities early, test and isolate those who had been infected, then vaccinate all of those in the immediate area. By 1980, it had worked. Smallpox became the only human disease to have been completely eradicated. Fast forward to 2006. A more seasoned Larry Brilliant offered a warning during a TED Talk. The world isn't ready for the next big one. Medical supplies and advanced warning systems were in no shape for a pandemic. And Larry called for investment in a new global system to stop deadly viruses before they could spread. I did a study of the top epidemiologists in the world, and they thought that if there was a pandemic, a billion people would get sick. As many as 165 million people would die. There would be a global recession and depression, and the cost to our economy of one to three trillion dollars, the consequences are almost unthinkable. Larry Brilliant, epidemiologists, technologists, philanthropists, bon vivant, raconteur. So good to see you, my friend. Bremer, the raconteur and beau vivant is yours, but I, I'm so happy to see you again, my friend. Your very famous TED Talk back almost 15 years ago now, warning the world about the next great pandemic. And at that point, you said uh, the numbers were pretty startling. A billion people could be infected, 165 million potential deaths. Um, could this have been the big one if it could have been, could it still be uh, the big one, given what we know now? Well, uh, it, it could have been a lot worse. Um, I think there's no question that a billion people will be sickened by this. Um, maybe, I wouldn't be surprised if it was three billion, but certainly more than one billion. We're, we're just early into it. We don't know that it's going to be a uh, a round one, round two, round three, like it was in 1918, where the second round was the most devilish. 
Um, so, so we don't know the answer to that question. Is it the big one? It's big enough. Um, I, I can't imagine that the death rate, which is now you know five percent, that death rate, of course, is art- artifact because deaths are reported earlier. You know, we epidemiologists have an awful but quaint term. We say that death is a hard endpoint. Right. You know, and we don't know how many cases there really are, right? No, we, we don't know how many cases. And until we get over this ridiculous uh, government failure of not having sufficient test kits, they should be free. They should be ubiquitous. There should be hundreds of millions. You should be able to get uh, both the um, uh, virological and immunological tests at home with a, a finger stick uh, for free when you want it without a, a physician's prescription. This is a pandemic. But when you talk about one to three billion people that are going to be sickened or in some way contract this disease, of course, that says that almost no matter what the United States does, um, those aren't U.S. numbers. Those are big, gaudy, every corner of the globe numbers, most of which has nowhere near the capacity to respond that the Americans do. So explain, well, what do you think the parameters but, but, of that look like? But see, that's exactly right. And, and that's why the, the failures in most of the developed world, let, let's put the UK and Sweden in that, in that same pot. Um, that's why they are so uh, uh, disappointing. Uh, because what's, what's the, the slums in, in Mumbai with the highest density uh, you know, of people per acre in the world? How are they going to? What about Kubera in, in Kenya? Well, look, we haven't even started talking about Zimbabwe and Venezuela and Syria and Afghanistan, failed states or states on the brink of collapse with virtually no public health system. Yeah, that, the deaths are going to come from there as well in higher proportions, certainly. Given what we do know, when you talk about one to three billion people, give me a sense of likely time frame. Give me a sense of you know, sort of likely mortality. Give me a sense of who's really going to face um, the greatest pain as a consequence of this, because I can see the emerging no- market numbers be high, but I also know that in those same countries, those slums, the, the age rates are, are really skewed towards much younger. So, yeah, I mean, do they yeah. get through it? All of that stuff. If it's going to take us 12 to 18 months to get a vaccine, yes, I know there's good news coming out of the Moderna and NIH vaccine, good news coming uh, out of the Oxford program, good news coming out of J&J. So let's say that we have a vaccine in 10 months, and let's say it's in the field in trials now, and that it's in the arms of first responders this fall, and it's available next year. So that's one year. Uh, It's going to take us six months to have the food fight as we figure out where the vaccine gets distributed. Will Bill Gates generous offer to stand up six vaccine uh, factories in the United States? Will that be developed in time to help? Um, will we be able to get India and China to develop vaccine in their, their formidable vaccine production facilities? In Africa, will we be able to stand one up? So let's say now you're talking about the full 18 months. So what happens after 18 months, it doesn't end with a bang, Ian. It ends with a vaccination program. And then you've got to go and deliver vaccine to 215 countries and not to the capital cities. You need to deliver it, as we just talked about, to the poorest and most vulnerable people in the most outlying areas, in the most remote parts of those countries. And what does that look like to you? It, to me, it looks like the polio eradication program. Or the smallpox eradication, mm-hmm. which you were a part it, of, yeah. yes, and and both of them, and I'm proud of them. And, but that's what we need to have again. We should be today thinking about what is that program going to look like that delivers two different kinds of vaccination waves. One, the kind of mass vaccination that increases herd immunity. Herd immunity is both the injected and the infected <laughs> who have become immune. Um, but we, we, should, we should raise the level of herd immunity, and then we should go after individual clusters that are resistant, communities that are having a hard time with it. But all of that should be done in a coordinated way, or you're going to have uh, countries that are so behind, lagging, that the virus continues to form a Wuhan or a northern Italy. 
So we should be thinking about that now. We should be fighting about it now, adjudicating it now, bringing it to the Security Council now. Nada, crickets. So three three years, a concerted effort to uh, flatten the, the curve. The curve is not Mount Fuji. This is not Mount Shasta. It's not Lone Mountain that has the same slope up as down. It's a tidal wave followed by rogue waves and echo waves and uh, and swells, <laughs> uh, the, the height of which depends upon how well we work and how good we are. Listening to you and watching you, I will say you came across, the assumption seemed pretty confident that, yeah, within a year to 18 months, it's not just that we could get a vaccine distributed, we are gonna have a successful vaccine. Is that an acceptable level of confidence to have? I mean, is it is it reasonably possible that we fail on the vaccine front? I am pretty confident that we will have multiple vaccines. I think we have 60 right now that are in various stage of uh, thinking about and doing. We have five that are in phase one trials. Yep. Um, I, it, it, it's hard for me to believe that we won't have a vaccine or said another way, we will have a vaccine whether it'll be as good as the smallpox vaccination or the polio vaccination. No, I don't think so. That took, in one case, hundreds of years. Uh, will it be better than uh, BCG or the seasonal flu vaccine? Yes. I'm highly confident that we will wind up with a vaccine that produces more uh, antigenicity and more immunity than the virus itself uh, at a 70 or 80% or higher uh, rate and does so for at least the period of observation, which is one or two years. And that allows you to really bring the economies back to functioning, right? Yeah. At, at the, okay. Yeah. okay, that feels yeah. good. So then let's go to these other questions. I mean, you talked about the other tools that we have right now. And what, one thing that, you know, and I'm, maybe it's part of physical distancing for you, but I personally have been surprised that there hasn't been more proactive discussion of mask wearing here in the United States. Um, if we had production, of N95 masks for everyone uh, and, and the ability to sterilize them, uh, would you be telling everybody to wear those? Yeah, or, or KN95, the Chinese mask, which the CDC reluctantly approved has just been tested in the 3M labs to find, and it's every bit as good as um, on, on the parameters that they check. Yeah, I mean, th this is a another example of a failure to have a national plan where you have a national testing lab. Since when does CDC cave in to political power and uh, approve drugs that don't work and tests that are questionable and have a strange view of masks? Why wouldn't we have masks? I, um, I just wrote about uh, the 1918 flu in San Francisco uh, where the city fathers, and they were only fathers in 1918, uh, in October, uh, thinking that the virus had uh, ended its round in, in San Francisco, decided to have a mass celebration in downtown San Francisco, Union Square. And the idea was that everybody would come together and do what? Remove their masks. This is 1918. Well, they removed their masks, they had a big party, and then exactly two incubation periods later, the virus came back worse than ever. Two lessons there. One, even then they had masks. Two, taking them off was a bad idea. So um, when I think about, um what we're doing now as we think about reopening the economy, relaxing the lockdown measures. Um, give, give us the Larry Brilliant plan in the United States, in the Bay Area, in New York, the places that are hard hit. What would the plan look like? First of all, I would, I would try to get the uh, hyperbole on both sides out of it. Uh, you saw the, the hyperbole in uh, Michigan and Ohio people protesting, open up without regard, pretty much, uh, reopen the economy. And you see people who are, they may never leave their apartment again, um, don't open anything. I think there's a, a, a prudent middle ground. The governor of Michigan who wanted to ban getting seeds and planting seeds for a house, a home veggie garden. Well, that's wrong. I mean, that's, that's clearly an overreaction. People should be able to do those things. They are pretty solitary occupations. Um, if we start adding in masks and in, I would add glasses 
and hats and gloves because the virus can enter through the eyes. That's why I recommend my friends have two hats, one that they leave outside. And when they go out, they put it on and they take it off. They leave it there in the sun. It'll kill the virus. And then another vi- another hat that you can wear the next time. Uh, I think if you wear glasses and hats and masks and gloves and you stay six feet away, you are, you've done a pretty good job. Uh, I don't recommend that for the rest of our lives. But for now, if we agree to that, then you can start opening up other things. Let's um, move to the tech side. How much is this going to be affected by the technology, by the contact tracing. Yeah. If we have to publicly opt in, if it's not forced, like it would be in China, for example, or Singapore, uh, how effective is that going to be? What, what do you think about how our lives will or won't change with the technology interventions? Uh, personal behavior dictates a larger range of public policy. So let's start off with what we have right now. We have uh, three or four bi-directional opt-in systems. The one that I like is COVID near you. It's been running as flu near you for about 10 years. They've got about three quarters of a million people who opt in and every week report their symptoms. And from that, we're able to get a very good spot map of the country and predict where flu and now COVID will be a couple of weeks before CDC will. Uh, If we can get 100 million people voluntarily opting in, even though it's not a stochastic random probability sample, um, we will have some wonderful uh, tools. When we look around the world right now, where would you point fingers and say, these are governments that have really, they've made big mistakes, they're making big mistakes, and we need to do something about it? There's different kinds of mistakes. Um, I think uh, you you can't make a bigger mistake than the UK made (laughs) at the very beginning. Um, Somehow, believing that you could stop the virus from uh, attacking and killing a lot of people by letting the virus attack and kill a lot of people. How could they, for a moment, believe something as silly as that? Now, to their credit, they've turned around. I don't know whether it's Boris being in the hospital, but I think they're now on the right path. But that moment- No, they were, they were turning around before Boris got in the hospital, actually. They, they just saw the numbers and realized that they were screwing up pretty badly, yeah. And I think in the United States, um, we had three different levels of failures. We, uh, Trump fired the uh, admiral, who was the only person on the National Security Council charged with looking around and worrying about bioterrorism, bioerror, and emerging communicable diseases. We defunded or threatened to defund or slow rolled the funding um, of AID and CDC funding 37 countries that were in hot spots that were likely to be accelerators of the virus. I think we've come back and we've started funding them again, but you you don't get back the time that you lose. And the best example of that is you don't get back the missing six weeks when nothing happened, when we had a flawed test kit because we didn't want to use the German-designed, Chinese-evaluated, WHO-provided test kit that everybody else used well. We wanted to do something special, and we over-engineered it. didn't understand how many reagents it would take. Uh, and then by downplaying and mau mauing the severity of the disease, we set in motion a, uh, a politicization of a pandemic, which is crazy. So you now have people who still believe it's a hoax. They still believe that um, it's mild. They still believe it's like the flu. We have governors who believe that. We have governors to this day that have not uh, issued social distancing orders. So I don't want to make this into an anti-individual politician or anti-Trump thing. I, I stay in my lane. I'm only talking about the decisions that were made that endanger the lives of people from this pandemic. And we've made a lot of them. Larry Brilliant. Thank you very much. Ian Bremmer. World is better with you in it, my friend. That's our show this week. Come back next week. Come back every week. Why wouldn't you? Because that's why you're here. You enjoy the show. But also check us out in our excellent digital newsletter. You should sign yourself up called Signal.